Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar series conducted by Sri, the Society for Health Research and Innovation. So let me remind you of some housekeeping rules. Keep your mics off always and the video switched off and this meeting will be recorded. So our topic today is exploring non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the webinar link will be available from 9.15 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. to join in and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points and the CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. This is to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD conducted by SHRI. So thank you for your strict adherence of CPD regulations and your kind compliance. So, regarding asking questions, you can question time is at the end of the webinar. And if you have a question, please type into, into the chat box. And please stay in your chat settings to all panelists and attendees so your questions can be answered. And if you have a very specific question about our topic, or oh, please email us on this email. So, today's topic is the silent epidemic. Exploring non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and let me introduce you our guest speaker, Dr. N. Satyasagaran, and he's a consultant. He's a consultant physician at Base Hospital Kalavanchikudi, and he did his MBBS degree from University of Jaffna and MD Medicine from University of Colombo, and he has done his overseas training in Harvey Base Hospital, Queensland, Australia. So he's currently working as consultant physician in base hospital Kalwan Shikudi. So we can start the webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Niroda, for your kind uh, introduction. And good morning, everybody. Uh, we will move to our lectures. So, silent epidemic, uh, exploring non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we are going to see today regarding the epidemiology, pathophysiology, terminology, Diagnosis, natural history, prognosis and complications, and management and recent advances. So when we see about this uh, prevalence, prevalence and incidence, most common it's a it's the most common li uh, liver disease in the worldwide, and it's the most common reason for unexpectedly elevated liver enzymes. And uh, the global prevalence is close to 25%. And the Asian prevalence is 52.3% uh, per 100% per year. And uh, our urban Sri Lanka, it's 33% of the people are affected. So when you see about the worldwide prevalence, the United States, South America, and Australia are mostly affected. Uh, our country is affected less compared to um, more compared to the European countries and it's uh, being an epidemic now. <clears throat> so what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? It's an excess fat accumulation in liver. It should be more than 5% steatosis assessed histologically or by image. There's no significant, there should be no significant alcohol consumption. That's men less than 30 gram per day and women for uh, less than 20 gram per day. And there should be lack of secondary causes of fat accumulation in liver and like medications like Wilson disease. Uh, and, and also there should be uh, absence of coexisting causes of chronic liver disease. Now there's a new definition for metabolic uh, ne definition. It's introduced by the 2020 an international expert panel regarding the liver disease. The definition is metabolic dysfunction associated steatocytotic liver disease. Why they introduce this one? Because the uh, one of the manifestation of metabolic syndrome is fatty liver. So to uh, uh, concentrate more on the metabolic syndrome, they have uh, created this one. So metabolic dysfunction associated liver disease. So these patients have a fatty liver that is more than 5% hepatic steatosis with at least one of the risk factors for cardiometabolic dysfunction. What are the risk factors? One is BMI, more than 25 uh, kilograms per meter square uh, for Asian or so, so, uh, for Asian uh, uh, less than 23. 
Yes, so more than 23. And the fasting serum glucose more than 100 milligrams per deciliter or two hour post load glucose level more than 140 or HbA1c more than 5.7% and uh, or type 2 diabetes or treatment for type 2 diabetes. Uh, third one is blood pressure more than 130 by 75, 85. And uh, the, the other one is plasma triglycerides more than 150 or lipid lower or patients with low lipid lowering agents and the other is plasma hdl cholesterol less than 40 for males and less than 50 for females so so this is the thing when the fat is in the liver it is called uh, the steatotic liver so more than five percent that's steatotic liver disease then we have to find out does the patient meet any cardio metabolic criteria which I mentioned earlier, five cardiometabolic criteria. If so, yes, then um, are there any other causes of steatosis? There are so many causes for fatty deposition in the liver. If there's no other causes, then that is called metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. If there's any other causes, it's alcohol, then alcoholic liver disease. So if there is, a, there's no metabolic, uh, any, uh, metabolic criteria is not filled with, uh, then it should be any other causes. If there's no causes, then it's crypto, uh, cryptogenic steatotic liver disease. If there are other specific causes, we can uh, uh, call by the name of, uh, name of uh, the specific diseases. So we should know there are many causes for secondary uh, uh, fat deposition. There are macrovesicular histologically as well as macrovesicular. So macrovesicular, excessive alcohol, hepatitis C virus infection, Wilson disease, A beta lipoproteinemia, parental nutrition, starvation, lipodystrophy, and a lot of medications that can cause uh, fat deposition like met methotrexate, tamoxifen, amiodarone, corticosteroids. So when we take the history, we have to uh, analyze all these things. And microvascular, uh, like HELP syndrome, acute fatty level of pregnancy, rare syndrome, inborn errors of metabolism, Everything can cause fat accumulation. So when we move towards the pathophysiology of the fatty liver or metabolic dysfunction associated steatosis, it is very multifactorial. Many uh, factors influencing the uh, fat deposition in liver. Most, mostly these insulin resistant plays a key role. And nowadays uh, there's a gut microbiota that's, uh, that has been studied extensively in animal studies. The changes in uh, normal uh, microbiota in the intestine causes uh, triggers uh, fatty liver for progression to the NASH. Uh, when they take out about the gut microbiota, there are some organisms, the people with fatty liver, they, they, uh, they, they found out there are, we know that there are a lot of microorganisms in the gut, so some uh, organisms are less compared to the uh, uh, normal, uh, normal person without fatty liver. So other thing is peptides and leptins, and there are a lot of environment factors. Uh, they are uh, st studying about the sleep, uh, sleep apnea, smoking, everything there. Nowadays, they are uh, doing research on this fatty liver. And other thing is very important thing is genetic factors, genetic modifiers like P and PL3 is one of the most important genetic factor, which uh, triggers the fatty liver. The other thing is excess liver lipids can also cause uh, fatty liver deposition. If they interact with each other, and I can say that this is the uh, there's a we can say there's a first hit. First hit means uh, a disposition of uh, fats in the liver. <clears throat> That's my, by so many reasons. Like uh, main uh, thing is insulin resistant lifestyle. Uh, Said lifestyle type diabetes, obesity, everything causes increased uh, uh, fat deposition in the liver. And second thing, heat is molecular, cellular molecular issues. That's the hepatic damage, inflammation, and fibrosis, necrosis are triggered by the second heat. That is uh, uh, a lot of uh, factors associated with that genetic factors and mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, fat oxidation. Everything causes. Um, triggering towards uh, NASH and cirrhosis. So when we uh, see about these uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, there can be fewer steatosis can be there, 
and uh, uh, in the, there can be steatosis and mild lobular inflammation will be there that is characterized as a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if it is NASH, that is in histologically early NASH, there will no no or mild fibrosis, fibrotic NASH, significant or advanced fibrosis, NASH with cirrhosis, F4, hepatocellular carcinoma, the last part. So when we see about the natural history of metabolic associated steatotic liver disease, uh, we can see so the healthy liver, they can 32-35% can go into metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. Then from there, 12 to 40% 40 40 can go into metabolic uh, associated steatohepatitis. Then 35% uh, can go to cirrhosis, early fibrosis. Then out of early fibrosis, 15% can go into advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis. But when we look into this, there is also reversibility also there in the natural history because uh, there are, uh, as I mentioned, there are so many factors associated with these internal factors, microbiota and external factors, uh, everything associated with this. So there is a progression as well as there is a regression as well. But progression is comparatively more than the regression. So mortality, when we look about the mortality in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the most common cause of death in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is not liver disease, it's due to the cardiovascular disease. Although liver-related mortality is the 12th leading cause of death in the general population, it is the second or third cause of death among patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And third cause is malignancy. And when we see about the risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, although I am mentioning non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we should change, change the name as metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. So, most important cause is unhealthy lifestyle, high calorie diet, excess saturated fats, refined carbohydrates, sugar sweetened beverages, high fructose intake, and Western diet. Especially the high fructose inta in intake is uh, uh, high risk, is prone to be high risk uh, to progress to NASH and advanced fibrosis. And the other thing is that sedentary lifestyle behavior. Other now uh, there are a lot of small, small studies are going on, other association with sleep also. So there's a uh, Seoul et al. in South, uh, South Korea, they investigated patients with a sleep pattern and uh, fatty liver, they found out mean sleep time uh, more than seven hours was having uh, less likely to have a fatty liver disease. So there are established association with fatty liver disease. One is diabetes, I mentioned, uh, obesity, dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and other associations like hypothyroidism, obstructive sleep apnea, hypopituitism, hypogonadism, and pancreatoidal resection, and psoriasis. And the other entity, which is, uh, which is a difficult one, that is lean non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, lean, lean. So more frequently observed in Asian population. So they have BMI is less than 23% in Asian and non-Asian 25. In Sri Lankan cohort, there are 16 patients was non-obese. The prevalence of NASH and fibrosis is similar to the obese non-alcoholic fat, fatty liver patients. Pathogens is unclear, however, thought to be due to insulin resistance and uh, the genetic factors. The, Visceral fat also, although they seems to be, uh, the BMI is not a good indicator to uh, uh, assume a patient is, uh, you know, without uh, um, fat, fat deposition. So challenges is to identify this metabolically obese, but not the uh, normal weight patients are, uh, it's a very challenging actually. And this is the diagnosis of fatty liver by ultrasound, you can see uh, uh, the sensitivity is around 85%, but it's reduced on obese patients and specificity around 94%. Uh, it can detect cystosis where steatosis when more than 30% of the liver is affected. So the diagnosis of not, uh, NASH, the clinical biochemical imaging measures cannot distinguish NASH from steatosis. Only we can say that patient is having steatosis. So to find out whether the patient is having no, uh, steatohepatitis, that can be only done by the liver biopsy. That's the gold standard method. 
So in the histology, when you take the biopsy and histology, you can see the steatosis and second thing is hepatocyte ballooning when the NASH occurs and mixed cellular infiltration will be there. And fibrotic NASH, there's a sinusoidal fibrosis there in the fibrotic NASH. So features, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in NASH, steatosis present in both, uh, both cases and hepatocellular injury is absent in the uh, normal fatty liver disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but NASH is present. Inflammation is absent here, but the inflammation is present in NASH and fibrosis is absent in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but uh, NASH absent or present. And prog progress to cirrhosis and liver failure minimal, but in the NASH is present. Hepatocellular carcinoma absent in the NASH is present. Oral, oral mortality is high in both cases. So uh, pathologically distinct condition, the two conditions are different pathologically distinct condition with different prognosis. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease has a good liver related prognosis compared to the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. NASH indicates an increased risk of fibrosis, progression, cirrhosis and possibly hepatocellular cancer. So NASH need a closer follow-up and more intensive therapy. So fibrosis is the most common uh, prognostic factor when we uh, see about the fibrosis. It's a fibrosis, the most important prognostic factor in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, correlated with liver-related outcomes and mortality. The presence of advanced fibrosis for under in-depth hepatological investigations, confirmatory liver biopsy, extensive therapies, and monitoring of fibrosis progression. So nowadays, we can say that the patient is having a, a liver a fat deposition by ultrasound scan or MRI is more sensitive, so we can say depositions there. But the progression of NASH, as I told, uh, we should uh, there should be a liver biopsy to confirm. But without that, there are non-invasive scores of fibrosis. To find out the fibrosis, there are non-invasive scores. Computer-based applications are there. One is NFS scoring, you can type and it's an, it's an application. And the other one is FI, fibrosis 4 score, FIB4. So these two applications have different um, entities. One, uh, they included age in NFS, AST, ALT, platelet count, BMI, albumin, and impaired fasting glucose, so diabetes. But FIB4 score only have age, AST, ALT, and platelet count. So there are. <coughs> Other non-invasive panels as well, enhanced liver progress panels are there, plasma level of three matrix proteins, and you, uh, yeah, that is useful in excluding advanced fibrosis. So other non-invasive uh, 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 scan to find out the fibrosis is a fibro scan that's called vibration control transient electrography. It's an ultrasound wave passed through the liver, stiffer the liver, faster the waves that travel to the liver. Stiffness measured by estimating the shear waves in the kilopascal. It's a helpful tool to avoid the liver biopsy because you can get an idea about the fibrosis. It performs better for cirrhosis than for advanced fibrosis. Higher rate of false positive is the problem. Affected by high BMI and or thoracic fall thickness. Helpful when trying to avoid liver biopsy. And the combination of electrography and serum markers might be more helpful. So this is the low likelihood of NASH and fibrosis. Uh, how we can find out this uh, age, uh, when there's a low likelihood is when the age is less than 40, type of diabetes not there without obesity. Hypertension can be present by fibrosis scan less than seven, AS less than 20, NFS scan less than minus 1.455, FIB less than 1.5, though that's a low uh, risk likelihood of fibrosis so there's the in the same way we can divide intermediate and high likelihood nash and fibrosis non-alcoholic fatty liver disease by these equations so uh, in our day-to-day -day practice we see many patients with elevated liver enzymes so they can have a moderate mild to moderate elevations uh, it can occur but alst to alt ratio should be less than one person. So when the AST ratio to ALT is more than one, then there could be alcoholic part. Oh, we have to think about fibrosis. When the fibrosis occurs, uh, so the AST level goes up, 
than the ALT. The other thing is ALP, alkaline phosphatase may rise up to three times of the normal. It is more than high, then we have to investigate for other etiology. And uh, other thing is prothrombin time, bilirubin, albumin, everything will be typically normal unless serotic. And we have seen that uh, serum is slightly higher in non alcoholic fat liver disease and advanced fibrosis. Uh, but when there is a iron depot, more iron deposition, the HFE gene positive, more iron deposition, then this, when the, these patients have uh, non alcoholic fat liver disease, the progression to cirrhosis is very uh, rapid. And they also found to be serum OT antibodies. Uh, they, they, there is some elevation of auto antibodies also can be found in uh, um, NASH, but uh, the clinical significance is uh, not very known. At the same time, we have to uh, exclude the hepatitis C, hepatitis B, B and the auto immune hepatitis. We have to IgG level. Uh, and uh, depending on the clinical grounds, we can do other investigations as well. <laughs> so I, as I have told, this only liver biopsy is the only tool to differentiate with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from NASH, but biopsy is very expensive and it requires expertise and carries some morbidity and rare mortal risk as well, done in only in selected patients. <clears throat> so which patient to biopsy? There's no consensus, no clear consensus, but uh, uh, Sri Lankan endocrinology journal suggested, so it's done by many hepatologists in Sri Lanka, they have suggested a liver biopsy may be considered in to exclude uh, competing uh, or, or co-existing eti etiologies for liver disease. Or second thing is advanced fibrosis, which is suggested by serum-based scores or imaging. Or to ex establish the diagnosis of NASH in patients with poor response to therapy. In these scenarios, we can consider a liver biopsy. So the management algorithms. So non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, when uh, we... Uh, diagnosed with ultrasound scan or other uh, screening. So what happens is we have to calculate the uh, FIB or NFS scoring. So NF FIB scoring is less than, is a, to find out if the patient is having fatty liver disease, then we have to find out whether the patient is having significant fibrosis. So, so for the significant fibrosis, what we can do is we, we can uh, use these uh, uh, non, uh, non-invasive applications, as I, as I mentioned earlier, FIB4 or NFS and, uh, applications we can use, and we can calculate and score. So we can categorize low risk of advanced fibrosis, high risk of advanced fibrosis, or in between. So now, again, I, so first, um, so leave uh, fatty deposit in the liver, then we are doing this uh, uh, non-invasive applications. And uh, for example, if the FIB score is less than 1.3, then low risk of advanced fibrosis. If the FIB score, FIB4 score is more than 3.25, then high risk of advanced fibrosis. But what happened to the in-between? In-between, what we are doing is we are doing the fibro scan. In the fibro scan, if it is uh, less than 7.8 kilopascal, then it is low risk of advanced fibrosis. If it is more than 7.8 kilopascal, then it's high risk of advanced fibrosis. If it is low risk, we can manage in the primary care. If it is high risk, then we have to refer to the hepatology clinic for assessment by hepatologist. So treatments, it's a multifaceted treatment approach is the ideal. So goals of treatments are decrease NASH-related mortality, reduce progression to cirrhosis or hepatocellular cancer, control of metabolic abnormalities, treatment of comorbidities, and decrease cardiovascular risk. So a uh, very important part is lifestyle modification, then tar targeting components of metabolic syndrome. And then we have to give liver, liver directed pharmacotherapy, or then the last part is complications, managing the complications of cirrhosis. So, diet and lifestyle modifications. So, we have to counsel for healthy diet and physical activity, 
So a, a moderate aerobic activity, 30 to 60 minutes, three to five days a week. And weight loss, five to 10%, improves NASH and fibrosis. So we can ask the patient to reduce their weight, standard weight 0.5 to one kilogram per week. And hypocaloric diets, that's 500 to 1,000 kilocalories per day reduction. And the exclusion of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease promoting components, we have to take the proper history again. Everything. And the Mediterranean type of diet and more, both aerobic exercise and resistant training effectively to reduce liver fat. So, this uh, Gomez et al, they did this research and found out how uh, it shows how weight reduction is important in the solution of NASH and fatty liver. So when they lose more than 5% of the uh, weight, so NASH resolution was 58%, but unchanged 42%. When the weight loss was more than 10%, the NASH resolution was 82% and unchanged in 18%. So this weight reduction is one of the very important factor in uh, reducing uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver and progression. So, who to give drug treatment? So, we have to do this. As, that should be progressive NASH. If there's progressive NASH, we can consider drug treatment or early stage NASH with increased risk of fibrosis progression. That were those people with the, the age more than 50 years, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, persistent age, elevation despite lifestyle changes, Patient who fail to achieve weight reduction, active NASH with high necroinflammatory activity. So duration of drug treatment, optimal duration of drug therapy is unknown. If the baseline ALT elevation didn't respond to the drug therapy by six months, it should be stopped. So there are said NASH targets for therapeutic uh, therapeutics. There are various. Uh, ways we don't we know that they are the pathophysiology they are first insulin resistant there are various medication to stop the cell stress apoptosis there are various medication inflammation anti-inflammatory agents are there fibrogenic uh, remodeling or antifibrotic agents these some agents are available some are on the pipeline so what what about the probiotics so we know that multiple preclinical studies, they show that the interstitial microbiota influences the cause of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, probiotics are not generally recommended for treating patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Only few clinical studies tested probiotics in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uh, there are more clinical trials uh, needed to define the beneficial of bacterial strain effective in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH. In future, uh, this uh, maybe uh, more studies will be concentrated on in the probiotics. SGLT2 inhibitors. So there is a Kuchi uh, et al. investigate the effects of emphaglyphosin on liver fat content patients with type 2 diabetes and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So emphaglyphosin significantly reduces liver fats compared with the CAR controls. So, uh, it meta analyzes, including seven randomized control, the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors on non alcoholic fat liver was investigated. Compared with the placebo reference therapy, the emphaglyphosin, canaglyphosin, or ipraglyphosin showed a small improvement in fat content. So, this is beneficial in steatosis in patients with the type 2 diabetes. Other medication uh, which is available is, uh, but although not recommend, but it's available, glucagon like peptide 1 receptor agonist. So, uh, multi center placebo control phase 2 trial, including obese patients with biopsy proven NASH, liraglutide 1.8 mg per day for 48 weeks was effective uh, uh, to induce histological resolution of NASH and significantly improve histologic scores of NASH compared with those. Uh, uh, compared with those uh, receiving uh, placebo. And uh, we know that uh, semaglutide, which is uh, approved in the U.S. for treating obesity, obese patients with uh, cardiovascular disease. 
So semaglutide also uh, proven to be effective when reducing the NASH uh, in uh, liver. So uh, people with uh, diabetes with proven NASH, they can, uh, uh, they can be treated with uh, the semaglutide. It is used as an off-label drug. <clears throat> there are another big trial, that Pivance trial, which uh, it is a large multi-center uh, rand randomized control trial in NASH patients. So diabetes patients were not included in this trial. It, uh, they investigated regarding the pioglitazone versus vitamin D versus placebo. Vitamin D fulfilled primary outcome. Improvement is NASH and no increase in fibrosis score. Pioglitazone fulfilled secondary outcome, resolution of NASH. So double-blind placebo controlled randomized phase 3 trial in adults with biopsy proven NASH and no diabetes or cirrhosis. So these are not investigated in diabetes patients. So vitamin E, they were taking 800 international units per day and pioglitazone on 30 milligram per day. We can see the reduction of uh, patients with resolution of NASH in percentage. So vitamin E targeting oxidative stress mechanism in NASH. So improves the transaminase levels, improves or resolves histology in NASH, had no significant effect on hepatic fibrosis. So it was used in 800 international units per day per dose. But the problem is side effects. The concern regard, uh, regarding the long-term safety of vitamin E. Uh, there, it is thought to cause uh, prostate cancer and uh, intracranial bleeding and uh, high in overall mortality. The other thing is pioglitazone is a PPR AR agonist, improves the liver histology in NASH and some improvement in non alcoholic fatty diversity activity score as well. No significant effects on fibrosis. Tested in diabetic and non-diabetic patients. Previous one, vitamin E only in non-diabetic patients. It tested in diabetic and non-diabetic patients. Dose was 30 milligram per day given and weight gain, bone loss and bladder cancer are major concern. What about metformin? <laughs> not recommended specifically for NASH. Does not improve liver histology, but improves insulin resistance. But it's safe to use for treatment of diabetes as a first line agent in non alcoholic fatty liver disease patients. What about the statins? Cardiovascular disease and atherogenic dyslipidemia are common among non -al alcoholic fatty liver disease patients. Statins. Reduce, induce serious liver injury is rare in clinical practice, not used as a treatment for liver disease, but statins are safe to use in non-alcoholic fatty disease patients, shown to improve cardiovascular outcomes in non-alcoholic fatty disease. There are many newer medication that is uh, being investigated. Elafibrano, a dual PPAR agonist, improving NASH without fibrosis, worsening, improved cardiometabolic profiles, well tolerated and no weight gain, post mild reversible increase in serum creatinine, diabetic and non diabetic patients included. These are the drugs which is on the pipeline pentoxyphylin and uh, orbitopolic acid. And there are many drug treatments being investigated. So what about the bariatric surgeon? So dual, so durable weight loss is achieved and improved survival. So uh, the um, bariatric surgery has cleared NASH in 85% of the patients and improved fibrosis in 34 patients, 34% of the patients. An option in patients unresponsive to lifestyle changes and pharmacology when otherwise indicated is an option. But the problem is there can be a perian post-operative complications. It's the problem. So, so far there was uh, no medication approved for uh, fatty liver by any, uh, any bodies, but the only, the, the very recently uh, approved in America, FDA approval they have given, it's uh, accelerated, accelerated approval, uh, the medication called uh, resmetriol Resmetrone. That is a that's a kind of thyroid hormone receptor beta selective agonist, which has shown to be effective in treating NASH as well as uh, reversing the fibrosis. 
So uh, when they uh, with the this superior to placebo with respect to Nash resolution and improvement liver fibrosis by at least one stage. So because of this uh, beneficial effects, the FDA has approved to use this medication from this year for patient who has uh, Nash with liver fibrosis. So this is the only medication approved by the uh, uh, so far approved for um, Nash alcohol, non alcoholic fatty liver patients. So, when we think about the mortality, the mortality non alcoholic fatty liver disease is significantly due to the cardiovascular disease, and all must undergo CVD risk assessment, and there should be aggressive control of CVD risk factors, healthy lifestyle, studying for dyslipidemia, good glycemic control top metformin and blood pressure control is needed and the follow -up, the optimal follow-up is yet un under determined risk of progression and underlying metabolic conditions are considered as i show we should monitoring uh, we should monitor the patient uh, routine biochemistry we have to do a uh, biochemistry and check it assessment of comorbidities on invasive monitoring of fibrosis standard follow-up of cirrhosis if present so we, uh, when uh, needed, we have to go for liver biopsy. So in summary, the prevalence of uh, non-alcoholic fat liver disease is increasing worldwide. Non-alcoholic fat liver disease is spectrum of diseases. Prognosis depends on the stage of the disease. Pathophysiology is very, very complex. Associated metabolic syndrome, lifestyle modifications are the mainstay of the management. And vitamin E and pyoglitazone are used in the treatment. There is no promise. Uh, yeah, there are only. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, sir, for your descriptive comprehensive presentation. And there is a one uh, one question in the chat box that it says that is there is a place in pyridazone in Nash? Yes. There's a place in uh, in, in Nash. Uh, it's a place. There's a place in uh, pyoglitazone. Yes. So vitamin E in uh, non-diabetic patients, they have tested, and this is in diabetic patient we can Nash. And uh, there's another question, sir. What about acidulcolic acid usage? Uh, that is not not uh, not uh, see, uh, not uh, useful medication in uh, fatty liver disease okay thank you sir and uh, another question is sir at which stage does nash become irreversible um when uh, they go into cirrhosis then that is irreversible but uh, uh, before that you know nash then uh, then uh, go into fibrosis and then cirrhosis in fibrosis state is still reversible even the natural history also there's a bit of reversible is there but when it goes into cirrhosis, then it's not reversible. Even the drugs that uh, newly I told, the new drug also introduced in America, USA for treating this NASH plus fibrosis. So there's improvement in fibrosis. So when they go into cirrhosis, then there's no regression. Thank you for answer, sir. And uh, there's another question asking, what should generally be the frequency of repeating LFTs, ultrasound scan in a stable patient? Um, there's no consensus so far, uh, but if you want to assess, uh, the many people are, you know, using nowadays uh, um, medications, but uh, I, as I showed earlier, the, the uh, weight reduction is uh, very important. That has, uh, you know, 5, 10 percent 10 of the weight reduction process, 85 percent resolution in NASH. So uh, that's very important rather than prescribing the medication without, you know, without knowing properly. But this uh, your question. I think uh, uh, there's no consensus. But we, we can at least three, three, three months or six months we can repeat, because we should know whether it's due to the you know uh, uh, really due to the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or some other disease causing the liver elevation. So if it is increasing go and uh, up, up and up, then we may have to investigate for a secondary course as well. Thank you, sir. And uh, they're asking. How long course of vitamin E can be given safely? It's a bit difficult question. 
um but uh, uh, because uh, you know prolonged um, uh, vitamin d e consumption can cause a lot of uh, adverse effects but uh, i would say uh, what they tell is uh, if it is uh, there's no improvement in six months we have to stop the drugs that's what uh, some uh, journals are saying i think not more than six months not good uh, so then uh, they are asking that uh, fish oil supplements and heme bovitia meats or whatever yeah they say fish oil uh, yeah omega 3 fatty acids especially they uh, they the, the researchers say that there's a, a decrease in uh, free fatty uh, sorry decrease in the steatosis there are some evidence that uh, the use of omega 3 fatty acid uh, is uh, reducing the uh, steatosis in the liver but not regarding the fibrosis or progression but uh, they reduce the steatosis and uh, there now uh, researchers are going on regarding the aspirin as well uh, so, but not no much uh, studies but there are few small studies they say they stop the progression to a uh, fibrosis but i think uh, uh, in future they may uh, show regarding the aspirin and the benefit on fatty liver disease thank you sir and uh, they ask uh, can we use enfagliflozin for nash patients without diabetic which one sorry can we use enfagliflozin for nash patients without diabetic uh without diabetes uh, ideally the uh, it is not recommended you know it's not recommended in the sense it's an off label drug so i would say patient with diabetes to use this um, scl2 uh, agon uh, antagonist yeah thank you patient sir patient with uh, diabetes yeah asking yeah uh, patient with diabetes on yeah patient with diabetes yeah. to use them and uh, what about reducing atorvastatins in in a third been with been high alt and ast levels atorvastatin in very high ast alt level very high ast alt level better to uh, not to use uh, uh, atorvastatin because first we have to find out the secondary cause we may have to exclude secondary causes thank you sir and uh, the next question that is there benefits from keto diet or is it harmful keto diet benefit ketogenic diet benefit of uh, harmful i i, I actually i i and uh, the same questions asked about the uh, like intermittent fasting sir like is there any benefit for the control <laughs> of nephron donation Uh, intermittent fasting uh, yeah they say some people some uh, people say that intermittent uh, can improve the you know uh, uh, the uh, insulin resistance and all if there's a insulin resistant improvement in insulin resistance there should be reduction in the uh, you know uh, steatosis as well but uh, there's no uh, proper uh, research finding to uh, comment on this actually Uh, thank you very much sir and uh, the other questions repeat like the same things and uh, there is something asking how to manage dyslipidemia and fatty liver when prescribe statins alt ast level rise so this what is the best statin whether simvastatin is the best statin to use um simvastatin is a better one uh, that uh, better outcome than atorvastatin uh, Yes, yeah, simvastatin is better one. Yeah. And they are asking, sir, management of patient with fatty liver and hypothyroidism. Fatty liver and uh, hypothyroidism. So thyroid diseases are associated with the fatty liver. So when we uh, treat the fat uh, thyroid problem, so the fatty liver should be resolved, isn't it? And uh, thank you, sir. And they ask for a recommendation that for a diabetic patient without a heart failure is it better to use empagliflozin or pyrethrozin as treatment for nephron i would say empagliflozin is better so for one last question sir sir what is the relationship between fatty grading and nash 
फैटी फैटी लीवर ग्रेडिंग एंड नैश इज एक्चुअलीजिकल so we can uh, the, the uh, imaging they say only the uh, fat content by grading uh, fat liver 1 2 3 4 but uh, the, the nash is different so uh, nash is a histological finding so we can't comment on this uh, thank you very much sir so that concluded the question and answer session and uh, So our sincere thanks goes to Dr. N. Sathya Sagar and the consultant physician based hospital, Kalavanchi Kudi. Thank you very much for the. Uh, uh, and for uh, thank you, sir, for the his excellent presentation and the precious time for your precious time, and for thank the. You. For the others, we need like uh, we need to fill the feedback form and also the Google form. We share the. link in the chat box so that you can the e get the e certificate so thank you very much everyone and find the link in the chat box so kindly give your feedback to us answer the post assessment questions so and we will uh, send you the e certificate so you will receive your e certificate for participation in like 3 uh, days and if you didn't get it you can email us so thank you very much and have a nice day